The following program is brought to you in living color. Hi, and welcome to another edition of This Week in TV History. I'm Tony Figueroa. If you like what you're seeing or want to have a comment, make sure you, you, you comment below and hit subscribe. Lots of likes. That would be appreciated as well. You know where everything is. So this installment, I want to open with a disclaimer, featuring a disclaimer. The program you're about to see is all in the family. It seeks to throw a humorous spotlight on our frailties, prejudices, and concerns. By making them a source of laughter, we hope to show in a mature fashion just how absurd they are. That's how it all began 50 years ago this week. The thing I remember the most of that time period was the show opening with an announcer saying, From Television City in Hollywood. And then the famous theme song played. Yeah, that theme song was a lot of fun when you're little, especially when Edith hit that one and you knew who you, you were then. It was a lot of fun. It was done before a live studio audience on videotape at Television City in Hollywood, not far from where I am right now. This show was the brainchild of Norman Lear. He got the rights to the English show till Best Lewis Part did an American version, using his own family as a great deal of influence. The show required three pilots before it was sold. Originally, it was going to be sold to ABC. They passed on it. They thought it might be a little too controversial. But CBS was very eager for something new and different, and the show was new and different. CBS had a whole decade of being known as the Hillbilly Network, starting with the Andy Griffith Show, Beverly Hillbillies, Petticoat Junction, Green Acres, Mayberry RFD. They needed something different going on. And this was definitely different. So this came right after the famous Rural Purge. And it changed situation comedies in the United States forever. This was a show that tackled subjects like bigotry, racism, the Vietnam War, the counterculture, the generation gap, feminism, the women's lib movement. Wow. And I'm just scratching the surface. There were a lot of episodes where you never saw the main four characters leave the living room, maybe go into the kitchen, but they often stayed in the one location. Many episodes took place on a Sunday right after church or on a weekday right after work. So everyone was together at, together in the house, and they were having those kitchen table discussions that people were having at the time. Discussions I'm a little concerned people aren't having right now. The show starred Carol O'Connor as the patriarch, Archie Bunker. Now, Carol O'Connor was an incredible stage actor, also had a wonderful career on screen, incredibly funny and incredibly skeptical that this show would be successful. He was living in Italy when he was offered the gig, and part of his condition for doing the show was to have a return ticket to Italy because he was sure this show would never air on American television. Now, his wife, Edith Bunker, also known as the Dingbat, was played by Gene Stapleton. His daughter, Little Goyle, or Gloria Bunker Stivic, was played by Sally Struthers. Some of you may remember her as the voice of Pebbles in the Pebbles and Bam Bam show, a spinoff of the Flintstones. And Archie's son-in-law, Michael Stivick, also known as the Meathead, was played by Rob Reiner, who everyone knows is one of the great directors of our time. <laughs> yeah, Rob Reiner came from uh, the School of Improv, and of course he's the son of the legendary Carl Reiner, who gave us the Dick Van Dyke show and many other projects. This show, wow, it is very difficult to quote lines from this show without uh, getting in trouble with YouTube. Or So, a lot of the episodes that I can find that I enjoyed very much, I'm going to have in the description below. Hopefully, I'll have links for you so you could go find those episodes yourself. But even quoting some of these lines, I'm a little fearful of getting in trouble. Sometimes when you're doing a YouTube show like this, even showing clips can get a, a little dicey. But we had this incredible cast. This show has the record for most spin-offs. Happy Days Comes Close 
but All in the Family first spun off Maud. Maud was a character played by B. Arthur, a lot of you know from the Golden Girls. She played Maud Finley, who was Edith's cousin, and she did one episode of All in the Family, and they knew she needed her own spinoff. By the way, her episode where she takes care of all four of the lead characters when they got sick, not only is a wonderful introduction to the character of Maud, but gives you so much information on Archie Bunker's backstory. Maud is the first time in history where a spinoff gets a spinoff, and that spinoff was Good Time, starring Esther Roll, John Amos, uh, and Jimmy Walker. And then later on, all the family spun off the Jeffersons, which spun off catch, uh, Checking In with Marla Gibbs. And then all in the family managed to spin off Archie Bunker's place, which spun off Gloria. And then, when all of these shows were off the air, Norman Lear went back to the well one more time and spun off another show called 704 Hauser Street, which was an African-American family that had moved into Archie Bunker's famous house. And the story continues from there. And even with that list, I am sure there's one I forgot. Now, you also have to keep in mind, Norman Lear was doing all of this while he had Sanford and Son on NBC and a show called The Baxters in syndication and One Day at a Time on CBS. The original One Day at a Time, not the one that he most recently worked on. But here is a show where nothing was sacred. You had everything going on from Edith going through menopause, Mike dealing with impotence, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., who was at the height of his career, played himself in an episode. It was hysterical. I know people say, well, that kind of took you out of the reality. Why would this A-list star be showing up at this blue-collar house in Queens? Just put on your suspension of this belief hats for just a second. Enjoy the show. It was very, very funny. One of the other great things about the show is as the show progressed, say the characters, even Archie, had a chance to grow and develop a little bit, some more than others. So you got to grow with these people. So when new situations would be happening in their lives, you knew these people already, and you got to share these wonderful experiences with them. Not all the experiences were great, but once in a while, they did have those moments. Like when Mike and Gloria had baby Joey. Moments in the hospital were hysterical. And, uh, Yep, Archie was in blackface. I'm not sure if you could do that again. Now, a lot of times when I bring up All in the Family in a conversation, the first remark I hear is, you know, you can't do a show like that today. It's funny when I hear people say, why can't we have shows like Father Knows Best or Leave it to Beaver? But now people are concerned that we just can't do the show that All in the Family was at the time. And again, I go back to, here are people that were covering topics that Americans were having at their kitchen table. The fact that people feel that you can't do that anymore concerns me. Because first of all, there's great stories to be told. But it also concerns me that we just aren't having those kitchen table discussions like we used to as well. So, all in the family, 50 years old. If you look at the show, it has made so many lists. Top 10, top 20, top 50, top 100. It is on every list of favorite show, most influential show, funniest show. And the character of Archie Bunker has uh, usually wound up on number one as the most famous character or the most popular character in television history. Carol O'Connor brought so much to that character and then later continued with that character onto Archie Bunker's place. A lot of people criticized the show, feeling that Archie Bunker glamorized bigotry. My initial argument to that was that's like saying, that's like uh, the sweat hogs glamorizing remedial education. But somebody pointed out to me once that there were people who idolized Archie. They saw somebody on TV who said what they were thinking, they didn't quite get that. Archie was making fun of them. The other thing about the show, especially with Archie and Edith, I 
think we all know an Archie and an Edith. It could be your dad, your grandfather, that uncle, that neighbor. There's elements of Edith, I'm sure, maybe in your mom, your grandma, an aunt, and a wacky neighbor in your life. Archie Bunker was, I would say, important when I was small because on the playground when we were really little and we had no concept of bigotry or racism or any of those thoughts, our teacher could see bad behavior or somebody saying the wrong thing and saying, hey, you don't want to be an Archie Bunker, do you? And that fixed the problem right there. So a lot of the name calling, a lot of the bullying, a lot of the behavior. We didn't fully appreciate what Archie Bunker was, but we knew we didn't want to be like him. At the same time, we thought he was really funny. When you're really small, he's just an angry man who is obsessed with a chair. But then as time goes on, you get to appreciate it. It's a show that you get to appreciate as you grow older and get more mature. You can see, wow, this was really something. Again, I hope that if you have comments, thoughts, ideas, suggestions, you put it down below. I'm in the mood to watch a few episodes, and the ones I can find that I think are historically worthy to be put down here, I'll have a link for you. And again, feel free to subscribe, comment. I'm getting very nostalgic for this show, and I have a theme song playing in my head. So... If there's an Archie Bunker in your life, I think you'll enjoy the show if you've never seen it before. And if you have, wow, it is something, isn't it? I'm Tony Figueroa, the child of television. Check out my blog. Listen to me on TV Confidential, a radio talk show all about television. We'll continue more of these discussions. In the meantime, stay tuned.